ladies and gentlemen, and very happy to be here. We had a one-year research project on um, the role of wood in Kosong in the inter-Korean border area with a grant from the World Wood Day Foundation, and I'm very grateful for them to, uh, that we could do this work. It uh, turned out to be quite a big uh, booklet here, but I will not read all. And what I want to talk about today is to talk a little bit about the, um, the motivation to do this research and then talk about three fields or four fields, uh, one being wood as a source of energy, uh, about wood and culture, traditional culture and modern culture in the uh, inter-Korean border area. I will focus on the southern part, um, on wood, forests and biodiversity, and finally forests and uh, unification. So starting with the first point, yes, uh, two maps to be seen. You see the red spot here is the position of um, Kosong in South Korea on the left hand. That is uh, on the very northeastern tip, uh, bordering the East Sea or Sea of Japan and bordering uh, North Korea. And you see on the right hand then um, that this county it's a divided county. You see this line going through the uh, map. That is a DMZ. And uh, the southern part of this county, Kosong County, is in South Korea, northern part um, in North Korea. And it's a co county of exceeding beauty with a forest cover uh, ridge of 70% roughly. For the whole province of 80%, uh, there are lagoons, mountains, uh, mo the most beautiful mountain. Uh, mountainous areas of North and South Korea are meeting there, the Sovak Mountain in the South and the Kumgangsan or Diamond Mountain in the North, uh, and uh, the sea, which is also very beautiful. Now, one uh, motivation to do this research was that forests, in a way, um, link North and South Korea, but also divide them because uh, both of uh, uh, them, North and South Korea, were originally covered by forests extensively, but both lost their forest coverage due to overexploitation in the uh, well uh, over a long period over several centuries, and then wars, especially the Korean War. But in South Korea, reforestation set in in the 1960s, and we have a recovered forest uh, there now, while in North Korea, unfortunately, the 1990s and the 2000s saw additional deforestation. And so the forest linked both parts. And there's another motivation to do this research. For what has been always very important for Korea, and I will show some examples for that, for their culture, in their everyday life use, and what still is important. But of the wood used for construction and for uh, furniture making, 90% are imported. That was originally uh, due to price relation and also due to the fact that South Korea started to reforest in the 1960s. In, in the uh, early 20th century, we had travelers to Korea saying, we see here the barren mountains, it's more or less like a desert. And, um, but, uh, uh, after reforestation now, Koreans have to find a new use. And if you look at the use of forests and forest products for Kosong, we find a lot of uses, timber, fuel, farm materials, nuts and fruits, mushrooms, medicinal herbs, wild vegetables, and also soil and stone come from the forested areas. In Korea, actually, forests are synonymous with the mountainous areas. The mountains are forest traditional and forests are uh, uh, mountains. We have practically no forests in the few flatland areas. These are used for extensive rice farming. If you look at uh, wood as a source of energy, we still find in Kosong, these are all pictures from Kosong, uh, energy as in use as it was traditionally, um, wood in use for energy as it was traditionally done, namely through um, uh, just burning it in furnaces. And uh, we know that this is not very um, uh, environmentally friendly, this use. These furnaces often are not 
very fuel efficient. And uh, with Gosson County, we started a discussion process based on the German experience. Those who come from Europe might know that Germany, uh, since a couple of years, tries now to achieve what they call an energy tra transition, a transition to renewable energies. And we brought experts from Germany there and discussed uh, German models of uh, uh, renewable energy use and uh, there were two models we looked at. One was the model of bioenergy villages, villages which completely are uh, to 100% are fueled uh, by bioenergy which includes uh, solar and wind energy but also wood chip energy. You see here a, a, a picture where you see how these are all related and we have an area in uh, northern Bavaria, the Franconian forest, where we have now more than 20 f villages completely um, using this um, bioenergy and producing more than 100% of their um, heating and also electricity with uh, renewable energy, so they become net exporters of energies uh, of fuel, with one exception, that's the transportation due to the car industry, is still not possible, but for heating and for electricity production. And also we have in Germany a system which we call the bioenergy model regions, and one of these, Bayreuth, became also a model for Kosong, uh, not the least because they also had a project to combine the use of energy with artistic projects. So they had a lot of projects where artists represented the use of the renew, renewables in uh, their work. Uh, we tried to discuss this with a small village, which you see here on the upper right hand, Songjongmi, in um, uh, Kosong County. It's a village of uh, roughly uh, 50 households, one of the typical small border villages with uh, a lot of economic difficulties where usually the young people leave the village because uh, there's no new jobs to get. Uh, in a uh, number of village meetings which were made possible through this um, World Wood uh, Day Foundation grant also, we uh, established that it was not possible yet to come to a um, wood chip heating system. Though forest is there, the economic use of it practically, as I said, does not yet exist in South Korea. For 50 years they reforested. They still have to find a way how to use these forests. Um, uh, though, however, we came to a start of a, a project of solar energy and we hope that by next year this village will be one of the first villages in Korea having 100% uh, of their electricity produced uh, by themselves, by solar energy. Uh, we now are in discussion of using the wood chips in a more in a way which might be economically more feasible and one re, uh, possibility would be to do it in the so-called condominiums which are these huge and not uh, well very likable um, structures uh, for mass tourism in Korea. As I said, Kosong lays at the East Sea at the, uh, and in the summer we have a lot of tourism. We have uh, had uh, in 2013 5 million tourists and um, these tourists, most of them go to these uh, what the Koreans call condominiums. These are mass tourism facilities and these would be ideal because they generate enough demand for wood chips and sustainable demand for uh, getting wood chip heating and we are currently discussing this uh, with the county. So this is the first part, wood, the use of wood as energy. And if we come now to the use of wood in culture, traditional and uh, modern culture. First, in traditional culture, I want to present you one example. There's a very nice small village, Wangok uh, village, or Wangok Maul, with a 600-year-old tradition and houses which are 180 years old. That's in Korea very old because these wooden houses tend to burn down occasionally and Korea had lots of invasions and wars where so that you don't have really old uh, structures anymore. It uh, was designated an important folk relic and one nice thing about this village, it's not a folk village. Here are real villages living and living with modern professions. It's not a museum, but it's really one of the few still existing villages in Korea where the traditional style of construction and uh, the use of wood as dominant building material coexist with a certain form of modernity. 
and the, it looks like this. This is a small um, uh, pavilion or, or a shrine built uh, in the village, and you see here an overview um, of the village. Uh, and here you see uh, the uses of wood as energy again uh, to cover the wells and to build the houses. You see also, uh, naturally, the people want to live a modern life, so they put their satellite dishes uh, in these old houses. It's not an easy life, actually. And it's uh, interesting, this is a village of people who 600 years ago, it's a clan of one family, actually, the Ham clan. They fled when uh, the old dynasty of Koryo was substituted by a new one. They were loyal to the old dynasty, so they stayed there for 600 years. Now, modern times make this increasingly difficult. So now we have movements out. We have some of the village houses um, converted to pensions to, uh, to, to take up tourists. But it's uh, one way where traditional and um, modernity, traditional modernity li live well, quite well together until today. And if we look a little bit more at the high culture, that's what we discussed before for other countries also. In Korea, we have the temples which embody this culture. Uh, Korea in the 4th century became Buddhist uh, with strong uh, traits of shamanism still and um, temples are almost always in the mountains and every temple actually houses uh, a special uh, building for the mountain god, the Shan Shin, and the Shan Shin Gak it's called this house and we have several of these temples also in Korea. Uh, the temple buildings are dominated by colored woods and these colors and carved woods and, and coloring and carving is not only for beauty but it's actually an aid for achieving the spiritual goals of enlightenment. And you see here examples from one major temple there, the Gonbong Sa or Gonbong Temple in Kosong. Uh, it's uh, fascinating to see and again if you ask how old this is, this temple is from the 5th century, but these buildings are very, very modern. I would say none of these is older than 30 years. Probably most of them were only restored in the last 20 years. It was in the zone which was completely out of reach to civilians until the early 1990s, because it's directly at the border area. And as I said, the temple burned down occasionally and they were rebuilt. However, the structure is the same than many centuries ago, because like in orthodox culture, Buddhist uh, temples are orthodox in that sense that it's a repetition over and over again. They're not distinct styles of today, you know, 500 years or 1,000 years ago, but basically they repeat what they did before. And you see there the wood carvings, the wood paintings, and you see it uh, here in another temple, the Wamsa, a smaller temple uh, directly in the Sorak Mountains, which I'm particularly fond of. And you have different buildings which are all have, have a meaning that uh, bell towers, uh, you have mythological animals carved specifically, etc. Wood was also important in everyday life, and um, as I said, Kosong is at the mountainside, uh, at the seaside, so it was a seafaring county, and you had wood, and you need wood uh, for the ships, but also in Kosong for a particular industry, that's the drying of fish. There is a fish called the Alaska Pollock, which is um, fished there in these regions, and these fishes are put in autumn in, on these scaffolds, wooden scaffolds, and they are dried there over the winter season, and then they are eaten. It's a kind of dish you eat with a beer in Korea, and it's very popular in uh, North and South Korea on both sides. And Kosong is that place where, at least for the southern side, all of uh, this drying takes place over the winter, sometimes at the side of the road where maybe also the, the cars uh, put some some of the gas in, but it's uh, Koreans like this. And that's a traditional way of the use uh, of wood. Now, if you look at this house on the left side here, that's a traditional Hanok or Korean style house. That's, and that's how Koreans think about these houses. For most of the Korean living in a wooden house, it's a sign of lower class living. And the dream of Koreans is to live in an apartment. That's a uh, very sad um, development of the 
uh, last 50 years, we have this urbanization, strong urbanization and strong um, uh, movement into apartments as this, which embody modernity and in the smallest villages, like in Kansong, which is the, this capital of Kosong, a village of 15,000 people, you still find these huge apartment buildings, partly due to the density of population. Korea is after Bangladesh and Taiwan the third most populated uh, densely populated countries in, in Asia, but partly also due to this image of modernity. We can fortunately say that at least in the last 10 or 15 years, also with rising income levels, this changed a little bit and we find a postmodern way of using more wood again. And this is in, due in infrastructure, for example here in these wooden ways or these wooden, uh, wooden walking ways. Koreans are great hikers. So they have hiking ways in the mountains made of wood now, and also increasingly more again in their houses, in their private houses or in pensions, as you see in these uh, examples here. So we have really a reappearance of wood. But as I said, this wood mostly comes, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's imported from foreign countries. Coming to woods and biodiversity, here you see an old picture of the temple I showed you just before, Gonmongsa, and you see that the mountains are basically, you have some trees there, but on the top they are deforested. And that's actually the view if you see North Korea today, it's exactly the same. And it's very sad. And it doesn't mean that the Koreans didn't, in a way, revere or, or, or care for their forests. They always had trees like this. 500-year-old ginkgo tree there, or on the left hand there is this um, plate of a hackberry tree, and also 500 years old, where they had these trees which they really cared for a lot, but generally the forests were not cared for well. We had forests as common grounds and they were overexploited. Today, as I said, since the 1960s, Korea tried to reverse it, and it was very successful uh, in doing so. So that today, again, we have for Korea, South Korea as a whole, a forest coverage of 63%, and for the Kangwon province, where Kosong is part of, more than 80%, almost 82%. Kosong a little less with 70% because uh, it's at the seaside, so it's a little more open there. Uh, most of the forest in the Kangwon province, and that's very special for Korea, is um, national forest because it's a border area and large parts of the whole county are out of boundaries for uh, civilians so they cannot enter there. All these forests were nationalized after the Korean uh, War. We see here some trends on forestry. I will not go into details, but we can say trees get older. We have more older trees now, which is very good, and we have um, also more mixed forests. We come to a balance of uh, roughly one-third mixed forests, one-third coniferous and broadleaf forests. Uh, in the coniferous forests, it's mainly Pinus densiflora, the uh, Japanese red pine, which is um, prevailing there, though in a very specific form. Uh, this county has a variatio erecta, which is a very beautiful one, also used in old, in, in the national treasures of Korea, like certain temples or gates, like the main gate, the, the south, south gate of Seoul, uh, and also the Korean pine, Pinus coriensis. One uh, of the problems we see in using the forest, there's a lack of forest ways, and I uh, find that very interesting. We have a, a tripling of forest ways in, in the Kangwon province from 2009 to 2012, but still standing at uh, less than three meters per hectare compared to uh, 26 meter in France or 45 meter in Germany. So they are really no forest roads. That's not a plaidoyer for building more roads in Korea. They have roads enough, but in the forest sector it's difficult also to harvest the trees. I will skip now a little bit because of time uh, uh, the discussion of uh, biodiversity in forests. You all know about the necessity of biodiversity uh, and we find it as well for 
plants as for uh, animals and we did two researches in, in um, Gosong. We established an eco-trail there and we did a research on endemic plants uh, along the eco-trail and I did also as part of this project research on forest birds. We have lots of bir uh, birds in Korea, around 90 species which are completely dependent on forests and we have other 90 species, among them those shown here like the mandarin duck which is also a national treasure which are partly um, dependent on forests like uh, small forest streams. Coming to the last part, forests and unification, it gets interesting, you will see a, a view of the border area um, and inside the DMZ and you see the green side uh, on uh, mostly on the southern part, that's the place where the forest did not change and the red uh, um, side is uh, the red places are where the forest degraded. You find it in particular um, on the um, southern part, on, on the northern part of the, um, of the DMZ and it looks like on the upper right hand there. So you have barren mountains there and in that sense forests could also become a kind of um, a linkage between North and South Korea and actually it has been a proposal by the South not yet taken up by the North to come to a joint project of reforestation which would give a number of benefits to um, North Korea um, in terms of microclimate. A lot of the floodings one occasionally reads about are related to the uh, uh, failure of forestry in North Korea and uh, in this picture you see on the lower right that the wish for unification, Tongil in Korean, is written there with trees into the South Korean mountains. Uh, our um, wish is also to work for that in our foundation. We have now three sites for afforestation in North Korea. Thank you very much. <laughs>